Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to the beauty of Northeast Iowa on Iowa Public Television. And the latest edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on Iowa Outdoors. We go off-road near Fort Dodge. Dive deeper into the legacy of Iowa's mining history. Then sunrise in western Iowa with Buck Christensen. And explore a trail in a minute. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. And a journey that will take you from here in northeast Iowa all the way to our state's western rim in the Lus Hills. But first, we'll venture on four wheels to a type of park rapidly emerging among outdoors-minded Iowans. A growing community of adventure seekers is using off-highway vehicles. And our state has several great parks specifically designed for your next off-road adventure. Whether you're a daring adrenaline seeker or want to cruise along slowly in a multi-passenger vehicle, these OHV parks have something for everyone right here in Iowa. As more and more people buy off-highway vehicles, or OHVs, there's more demand for places to ride them. OHV is an umbrella term that includes all-terrain vehicles, or ATVs, off-road motorcycles like dirt bikes, side-by-side -side machines, and snowmobiles. Midway through the process of building and designing this park, we all of a sudden we have a new machine that was the fastest growing machine out there now. The side-by-sides are you know, family oriented, you know, people that want to take their spouse that may or may not want to ride, they can switch off if they both want to drive, you can take your family out. It makes the, the sport way more sociable to go out and, and visit with your friends and stop and you can point out the wildlife or whatever you want to do while you're out riding. About 30 years ago, Iowa didn't have any parks where people could legally ride off-highway vehicles. Now, there are eight parks scattered across the state. Gypsum City OHV Park, located southeast of Fort Dodge, is the largest park in Iowa for motorized recreation. At almost 800 acres, it's about as big as the other seven Iowa parks combined and features more than 60 miles of trails. I've ridden all over the country, the United States and Canada, and these are as good of trails as there are in the, Midwest, or in the country, actually. Um, people that come out to ride these trails are just blown away once they get out here and see what we actually have. So the ability to be able to provide that active recreation in the motorized sport, provide a tourism area for our community, and then also be able to, to manage wildlife on an 800 acre facility, all is a, you know, a great, fits within the mission of what we do in Webster County Conservation Board. The park sits on land that was once used for gypsum mining. Iowa ranks third in the country in gypsum production and two-thirds of Iowa's gypsum comes from the Fort Dodge area, an industry dating back to the 1850s. Three different national companies donated the park property. The land is no longer suitable for urban development, or much of anything else, but the combination of flat, open areas with rolling hills, tight turns, and wooded terrain is perfect for an OHV park. We have a lot of property that, that could be reclaimed, we have additional property that we think will be reclaimed and owned for further recreational purposes once the gypsum is mined out of it. It's a perfect reuse for property like this and it avoids uh, reclamation laws that previ previously existed for those companies. So it's really a win-win for everyone. 
they're all good that I've been to, but I think this one's the best. It's the hilliest, and it's just about all timber in phase two anyway. And for us guys, it's <laughs> I don't couldn't do much better in Iowa. There are three phases within Gypsum City, with dirt and gravel trails tailored to different vehicles. The park also offers a small track for kids, a training or practice area for beginners, a mudding area, and even non-trail recreation opportunities like fishing ponds. But the campers will be able to view right out over the top of those ponds. They can come down, we'll have fishing docks. We have the opportunity to ride a week for trails and not get bored. We've got the, the ponds, the, the, the wildlife, it's just a, it's a great opportunity. So every time I get here and, and see people enjoying it, it was worth the 16 years. Our trails are all marked for uh, numbers. Uh, with over 60 miles of trail, it's pretty easy to lose track of where you're at. So we have a numbering system and then we have a difficulty rating system too. So we try to provide something for everybody. I love being out here. I mean, it's enjoyable. And then just the um, pure enjoyment of people coming out here and able to enjoy what, where I work and what I do and get to see all of this. For those looking for a little more adventure or a tougher challenge, there are a couple areas in the park designed to provide an extra thrill. We got some of these guys and myself once in a while, like to get out there and put the machine to its, to its test, see how much of an incline you can go. We have logs, rocks and stuff. It's a slower building trail, our slower running trail. We can get up, it's, a, it's more of an obstacle course. Sometimes you're not gonna make it, sometimes you're gonna bend a fender, but it's, it's not for everybody. So we have the purse, we have those dedicated areas for the people that wanna go out and really put their machine to the task, put their abilities to the task and, and see how much they can do. It's, it's a lot of fun. They do need to be registered with the state of Iowa. So in this sport, you know, they pay to play. So they pay a registration sticker, off, much like fishing and hunting licenses, that sort of thing. They register their machine, and then that money goes back into the program to be able to support these parks and the system. So um, they do also, we do require a helmet. So uh, unlike on road traffic in Iowa, you don't need a helmet. In Iowa's designated OHV parks, you're required to have a helmet as well. Gypsum City OHV Park is a collaboration between local organizations and city, county, and state government entities. Everyone working together is one of the keys to success. You know, it's a nice marriage with Brushy Creek and with the trails the city has built, the trails the county has built. Having this and having connections to all of these things makes it a great place to, um, in the middle of rural Iowa, to come and recreate. It can be a dangerous sport, so safety is stressed. Wear proper clothes and equipment. Follow the park rules. And take a safety course online or hands-on. Do those things, and just about anyone can enjoy riding. We've got a lot of 60-some-year-old riders coming up to, to utilize a single track in this park. It's, it's all ages. Uh, people with disabilities, I'm in a wheelchair. I got hurt in a diving accident. With a slight modification of the side-by-side, -side, I'm out here recreating with all my friends. I always say it's a great equalizer. This isn't just a guy sport, it's, it's a family sport. We, a lot of our clubs are about 50-50 men and women riding. A lot of the gals go out ride on their own machines and actually go ride without the guys. Never thought I would have a side-by-side, -side, but last March I bought one, principally for hunting, but I find myself driving it and out here and uh, doing these kinds of things more than I use it hunting. It's fun. I have a handicapped son uh, that's 17 and he just loves coming out in this uh, side by side. So I take him a lot on the weekends. After nearly two decades of work, Gypsum City is a premier destination for off-highway vehicle riding and other outdoor recreation. A destination organizers hope will soon attract hundreds of thousands of visitors a year. I think motorized and recreation in Iowa is definitely increasing. You see more people pulling trailers. Um, we're, we're getting requests a lot of time. We're seeing visitors already coming out of Minnesota, uh, the Omaha area, so it's starting to draw people out of some of the larger urban communities that don't have these type of opportunities. I love every time we come out here and get to show it off. It's, it's, we're very proud of it. I think we hit a home run on what we wanted to do and what we accomplished. To the average individual driving across Iowa, they may assume that our state's single greatest resource is at the soil level and above. But look below the corn and soybeans and you'll find an even richer story. A generation before modern conservation efforts, Iowa mining companies laid siege to the natural resources of southern Iowa. Today, the clock is ticking on mine reclamation efforts to save the land for the next generation. 
Tucked behind the rolling hills of southern Iowa hides the story of an industry that once fueled our state and the nation. Without question, the first real boom crop of Iowa was coal, with coal having been discovered across 26 Iowa counties from the 1840s to the 1970s, more than 12,000 acres of Iowa land were mined. Over 40 years since the last coal mine closed, remnants of this once thriving industry are still visible. That being hundreds of abandoned surface mines. So the surface mining law came into effect in 1977. So anything prior to that didn't have any regulations on coal mining. And so that's what happened here, that people would come out, they would mine, they would toss the good topsoil behind them, they'd put all the spoil material on top of that, and then just walk away when they got all the coal out and move on to the next site. With abandoned mines ranging in size from a few acres to well over 100, sites such as this one just south of Attica are impressive visually but they are also a perfect representation of environmental indifference. The detrimental effects of these sites impacts rivers, soils, wildlife habitats, and quality of life miles from their locations. You can see the, the red water that's coming off these sites, the, what we call acid mine drainage. And it's a, a very low pH, high iron uh, levels in, the, in this water that's, that's coming off these sites and going into the adjacent streams which eventually will get into the, at this point into the Des Moines River which is used for a lot of these communities water source. Today the abandoned mined land staff of the State Mines and Minerals Bureau heads the effort to reclaim these sites. Since 1983 Mines and Minerals has developed a statewide site inventory interpreting and ranking environmental assessments for each site and working with landowners to develop reclamation plans that best suit the land use of each project. Every site's a little different and responds a little different, but the, the key point to uh, keep in mind here is all of the mine spoil and everything that was here before is still here. And all we have done in the excavation process was move it around. We created slopes that are more gentle, less likely for erosion, but it's still there. And it's going to take it a while for it to bounce back and support that vegetation. Transforming a mine from abandoned dormancy to active reclamation project to treated and seeded earth is an arduous process. But the most important stage comes from landowners themselves, where in conservative land management will allow the reclamation to hold. Two years past the active stage of reclamation, Todd teaches land is showing vibrant signs of life with grass growing, wildlife returning, and a much healthier watershed. There was no cattails grown in the old site or the water or anything. The pH was just way low and it wouldn't support any life. Where now you got frogs and stuff's growing in it. Before a mine comes close to looking like Todd's, the active process of reclamation is where the real work takes place. Just east of Knoxville, this site is a good representation of the many characteristics of an abandoned mine. So we have the high wall, we usually have the low area, which is the pond, um, and then we have the piles behind it. Spoil piles, high walls, and pit ponds are found at virtually every abandoned mine, with each situation representing a different hazard. Spoil piles typify the remnants of hazardous materials and stripped earth. High walls often hide treacherous cliffs to animals and humans, and pit ponds are stagnant pools of dangerously acidic mine runoff that can sit for decades without draining. When we get some of our sites that would be turquoise or orange in color, virtually clear, you can see down in because there's nothing surviving in them. Recovering mistreated land looks a lot like a construction site, with bulldozers and earth movers clearing debris, establishing gentle hillsides for drainage, and filling in the low-lying area with natural material before draining any remaining runoff. But when there's something growing, that's yeah. a good sign. If it'll grow weeds, it'll grow grass. There you go. As none of Iowa's reclaimed mines are on public land, ultimately private landowners are responsible for the long-term success of reclamation efforts. So in the final stage of land management, a farmer's knowledge of caring for their soil becomes extremely important. Uh, anytime you're adding that compost, it makes the ground healthier from what it is. You're building the organic matter up in it especially this type of ground, it can use all the organic matter it can get. There's just virtually none in it. One thing that they have to keep in mind right away is, even though this no longer resembles the mine site that it was before, it's still not the same as other property they may have. And this is gonna take a lot more care 
to make sure that you're not overgrazing or you're not mowing it too low, or if you happen to take hay off from it, you don't cut it three times a year. While Todd's land is vibrant and prospering, there are still many sites waiting to be reclaimed. In the 30 plus years Mines and Minerals has been tasked with reclaiming surface mines, only 100 different sites have been restored. It is a little bit disconcerting to know how far we have to go, that we've been working at this for 30 years and we're only a third of the way through of our sites. And depending on the, the future of the program, it is set, set to sunset in 2021. I'm optimistic for a reauthorization so that we'll continue the work, but we don't know that future yet. A year after our first visit to Attica, reclamation efforts are finally underway. And while the wheels of conservation may be deliberate, one by one, the environmental blights of Southern Iowa are slowly but surely being erased from Iowa's countryside. It's excitement to see everything that we get done because this is from pre-reclamation to almost done and then in a year we'll have grass out here and it'll be very hard to tell that it was a, uh, an abandoned mine site at that point. It requires a lot of patience uh, because the process is not quick and there's such an inventory and limitations on dollars that every landowner would like to see theirs done, most mm -hmm. of them and they'd like to see it done yesterday. And it just doesn't happen that quick. It'll be way beyond our careers mm -hmm. that this is going on. But the satisfaction comes at that point when we can drive by and go, we had a small hand in that. If you had 30 minutes each day to photograph nature, where would you go? It's a question often posed to one Western Iowa photographer. The answer forced him to rediscover the natural beauty found just a short drive from his own home. And even though the Omaha Council Bluffs region has its fair share of urban settings, photographer Buck Christensen found his own optical oasis and a moment in nature in his own backyard. I just love it, it's, it's like the greatest place to start your day. That's the biggest motivation I have. It's not necessarily f uh, about photography. Um, it's just when, when you get there and you, and you kind of settle in and you stay still and the geese start gliding past you and the, and the frogs all start ignoring you, it's just like you just kind of become part of the scene. Buck Christensen starts his day a short drive from home in Council Bluffs, here at Lake Manawa State Park, where sunrises have been captivating him for years. I think you're tempted as a photographer, especially when you're starting out, to use the tools um, and to see how far you can push stuff. And it's kind of fun to see how surrealistic you can make something. And then I think I've come to the point where I've settled in and I like to represent it the way I saw it or the way I felt it instead of this other world that a lot of photographers seem to be stuck in. These early mornings are at the heart of Buck's connection with nature and his camera lens. But his photographic itch started before discovering this signature mirrored image at Lake Manawa. He spent years along the western rim of Iowa documenting rural scenics and his favorite subjects after long drives along our state's county roads. I get that people like certain subject matters for photography. Um, but I, I, I appreciate barns and I appreciate windmills and I appreciate uh, lakes. But as time marched on, Buck and his wife Terry had a daughter and the realities of life began to shrink his photographic free time. Buck had a choice. He could let his photographic ambitions fade away or find subjects closer to home. It's very important to be able to find some place around here uh, just to be able to just work it into my day. You know, if, if I have 15 minutes, I can get somewhere in five minutes. I can take a few shots. I can kind of kind of get that out of my system and then go on the rest of my busy day. Let's steal one of yours. <laughs> no, I, don't, I already have yellow. I need purple. I need purple. I'm taking purple. I'm taking okay, purple. <laughs> you can go again. You it's your turn. Hey, mom. if you get it, you can steal it back. When I was forced to look more locally for, I mean, because I still had that 
that passion to do photography. And after we had our daughter, uh, it was, it kind of kept us here. Um, so I still had that itch. And so um, I just started to look around at more familiar places. And that's when I found uh, that spot, um, just kind of happened by it. And it's a series I've continued um, since then, since about 2011. It's so peaceful there, especially at 6.15 in the morning. Sometimes I get here and there's no wind and it's crazy foggy and it's, it's actually better when the sun's high. Um, so I'll stay here for until the last possible second I have to rush home and go to work. While the sunrise at Lake Manawa is clearly his special place, he's found ways to document nature in his other urban surroundings. Along the Missouri River, a mixture of skyline, water, and the region's signature pedestrian bridge have made for abundant photography outings. There had to have been a better way to go than this. I think usually when I come this far, it's just to hang out. I mean, you get, you get two reference points of the, the bridge and the, the Omaha skyline. I've always liked the, the curves of it. It's really cool. Kind of what I always like to do is take an unlikely place and try to find some type of beauty in what you'd normally consider pedestrian. Since it's not a mountain or a, or a ocean or, you know, whatever, uh, it's, it's fun to completely uh, obscure the background. And that's why I love the fog so much. And I don't know, if you've seen my, show, my shots, you know most of it is in the fog. Uh, it, there's more questions to, you know, to be asked than there are answers in a photo, and I always love that. I, it's, it it kind of creates a sense of timelessness or placelessness. It's just this, this weird figure, you know, disappearing into the fog. It's so fun. I love that. Now, whether there are a bunch of ticks, I don't know. Maybe that will be bad. In a location where the Lus Hills skirt the central and eastern edge of Council Bluffs, Buck has found symmetry and a unique juxtaposition between the natural environment and the region's industrial features. I shoot a lot in the mornings and you come up here and it's just, it's just birds and deer and me and it's, just, it's gorgeous. We used to travel a lot and that's kind of the conception I had of photography was doing a lot of travel photos and find, you know, going to the ocean and going to the mountains. And this is the kind of place that I would look for and find if I were to go visit somewhere else and it's kind of crazy that it's so close to home. While the Lus Hills and the Missouri River have provided ample opportunities, Buck's favorite spot seems to be back at Lake Manawa in the wee morning hours before many Iowans are even awake. I, I love it. I mean, it's just a place to completely forget about whatever things you have going on in your life, about whatever's stressing you. Um, it's, it's a renewal every time I go out and do it. It's, it's just a, an escape. His signature photo collection is actually focused on a small, narrow strip of land seemingly floating in Lake Manawa. It's known as Boy Scout Island to locals, who generations ago as young boys spent summer nights camping along the shoreline. It's that personal history combined with striking sunrise reflections that have caught the attention of Buck's lens and his many fans. I do a lot of photography shows, and as soon as someone sees it, they instantly recognize it. I've, I've never had someone say, where is that? They're always like, oh, that's Boy Scout Island. You know, and then almost everyone has had a wedding there or, or uh, you know, their kids used to play there 40 years ago or whatever. It's just like this common it's a common place. And they were kind enough to just drift into the frame. Uh, so that kind of created the, uh, a moment that I wasn't prepared for, but that I was, you know, prepared for. I was taking a picture of it. Uh, they just drifted right in and I snapped it. And it's, it's kind of one of my, my new favorite images. As he flips through hundreds of photos printed from Lake Manawa sunrises, it's clear they are only a fraction of the thousands of exposures Buck has snapped along the rocky shoreline. And a reminder that his destination close to home is a perfect example of balancing photography and family. I hear that all the time. I hear that from friends who want to go take pictures. They think they want to take pictures and then 
when it comes time to go just run out and do it, I don't think they understand how accessible everything, how, how easy it is, how little time you need to take to just go out and five minutes away find a state park or something and just go do it. It's time for IPTV's Trail in a Minute, where we show you a first-person view of a different Iowa hiking, biking, or water trail each episode. It's a great opportunity to relive a previous outdoor experience or to plan a future adventure. And it's a pretty cool way to view the Iowa outdoors. Take a look. For a quick hike with a big payoff, look no further than the Horseshoe Bluff Nature Trail in Dubuque's Mines of Spain. Tucked right along the Mississippi River at only three quarters of a mile, the nature trail packs a great deal of Iowa scenery and history. Credited as the first European settlement in Iowa, Mines of Spain's Horseshoe Bluff provides picturesque wetlands to the south and beautiful geological bluffs to the north. As you wind your way along the trail, it won't take long before hikers reach the awe-inspiring horseshoe-shaped bluffs from which the trail got its name. After you've finished soaking in the trail's geological history, it's time to climb and get an even greater view of the bluffs from above, and ultimately, the Mississippi River. The Mines of Spain's Horseshoe Bluff Nature Trail, a quick hike you won't want to miss. That wraps up this episode of our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy Iowa's parks and recreational opportunities. And if you're planning any outdoor travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. Our latest season of Iowa Outdoors will continue and have more episodes than ever with stories from every corner of our state. We'll leave you now with some more images of Iowa's outdoor environments. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.